My name is Rehan Kapadia. I am a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Southern California, and I got my PhD in electrical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. As a part of my job, I routinely have to make really important presentations to funding agencies, to colleagues, and to students. And nowadays, this is happening more and more over video conferencing, such as Zoom. Recently, my father, who does presentations as a job, was running through some slides with me that he had put together on a video presence. Now, what I wanted to do was review those slides with him right now and go back and forth and try to discuss and record what we thought some of the best ways to improve your video presence uh, is and how we can implement them to make our communication over video conferencing more effective. Thanks, Rehan. Yeah, I really enjoyed the way you analyzed the slides and the tremendous feedback you've given me. And I believe with everything inside of me that for society to progress, the scientists and the thinkers and intellects and uh, certainly the engineers, which is my background, must, must improve their communication skills generally. But certainly now, given the new reality, their Zoom presence. So I'm so happy to be going over these guidelines and these best practices and the case study, then I'm looking forward to a good back and forth and brainstorming session with you. So shall we proceed now with the slides? Okay, I'm ready to go. Why don't you share your slides? Thanks very much, Sam. Let's get into it. Here are the slides. I've called this video presence. Think about it. Like I'm going to give a presentation at work. I have to dress up properly. I'm going to have guests coming home. We have to have the house nice. I'm going to have an important meeting in the conference room. We have to square the conference room and make it look professional and polished and personable. So we are attempting to do exactly the same thing with our setup in front of camera. We've got an agenda that goes like this. We'll cover the guidelines, three plus one guidelines. Um, that, that really is all this presentation is about, but for it to sink home, to, uh, for us to engage, discussing case studies is very good. Then I'll recap it once. Hopefully that will strengthen memory. And then I've got some important slide, side notes. This is on actual the use of slides and the way to record in such a way that it works well for the audience after the event. And finally, some end notes, which is when you go beyond framing and lighting. So first agenda item is the guidelines. Now, I'm going to ask you to try to remember them. Okay, Three visual guidelines, one audio guideline. This is probably the most important. You've probably heard of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule or the 70-30 rule. 20 or 30% of the effort will give you 70 to 80% of the result. This is that rule. Face optimally lit up. This is the most important thing. If your face is not lit up, everything goes downhill from them and your eyes should be clearly visible because the eyes are the heart of communication. Uh, we talk about background and clothing. Don't want to go into the dramatics or the visual choices. They should not distract and they should not dominate. That's guideline number one. Face optimally lit up, eyes clearly visible, background and clothing should not distract or dominate. Any questions on this one? No, I think this makes perfect sense. And, you know, the, the, I guess the key thing here is that uh, what we're trying to do is highlight the face uh, and at the same time, not necessarily distract from it when we have clothing or, uh, or the background, not use the background to distract from it. Second one, this is probably the one with which most are least familiar, lens at eye level, lens at eye level. And the only thing that requires practice, look directly at the lens while speaking. We tend to look away and then it feels we are disconnecting from the audience. This sometimes feels a little bit unnatural, unreal, but it is key. Look directly at the lens while presenting. I repeat, this is what requires practice. Any questions here? I think uh, I, th I think it actually makes sense. And, and you know, if, the, if we can probably look at it in a different way in the sense that when you're talking to someone, you generally look at their face. You generally look at, you know, uh, you kind of engage with them. and. And if you're not looking at them, you're looking away, it, it oftentimes seems like you're, uh, you're disregarding them or you're not paying attention. And so looking at the lens is, is the equivalent of uh, you know, looking at someone's face and just showing that you're engaged with people. You, you've nailed it, except that it's natural to look at people's face, but it's not natural to look at the lens. So practice, practice, and seek feedback also. When you're giving Zoom, ask someone, was I looking at the lens? And the key is sometimes you have to look at the slide. But if you're going to look at the slide, don't speak at that time. Look at, then look at the lens and speak. Oh, that's Let's actually go. great. That's a great point. So 
Um, it's uh, it's kind of like equivalent to when you're giving a presentation and uh, you know you have slides behind you. Uh, and generally what you're trying to do is you're speaking towards the audience and every once in a while you'll turn towards your slides. But when you turn towards your slides, you generally want to you know use that as a brief second to compose your thoughts and try not to uh, necessarily speak during that time. Actually, you've unmailed, I'm, I'm digressing a bit, but this is a key point in really powerful public speaking, especially in auditory. A speaker will look down at his notes. I'm talking of people at the presidential level. This actually, there has a name for this technique. It's called the Churchill Roosevelt and Reagan technique by some uh, professional speech writers and speech coaches, which is you never speak without looking at someone in the audience. So use your time, look down, look up, and then speak. That pause is very powerful. So I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't plan to go so advanced right away, but this is a key point. And the third guideline. Have a little bit of space between the top of your head and the top of the frame. Four fingers is a good guideline and anywhere from mid chest to above belt, because this is how people would look at you when you are in the room. This is what they would come into their frame of focus. So making a little bit of an effort to get this right makes the person feel very much that you're in the room actually looking at them. Any questions, son? You know, I think uh, I think this one is probably the least uh, natural of the uh, of the guidelines because there's not really an equivalent principle to when you're necessarily interacting in a room with someone. But I guess the the way to think about it is that you're just trying to frame yourself such that there's enough of you visible so it's not disturbing to the other person, so it's not distracting. And so, okay, excellent point. But what we'll do is we'll bring up this very topic in the case study, and you'll see how effective it is. Okay, so now the audio guideline is something that if you haven't heard it before, you will miss it. Poor audio is far more fatiguing than poor video. So sometimes if you're watching a video and you just put it off without knowing why, it's probably because the sound quality is so bad, it's taking a lot of extra attention. So if you are going to make one investment, a good microphone or even a good set of headphones with a mic is a very good investment. It will probably serve your audience better than any other investment you make. Good audio quality is very pleasing and poor audio quality is stressful and you don't even realize that this is what is stressing you out. So external mic is a good investment. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I think um, uh, that's something that you really won't, you really won't know if you have bad audio or not. So that's something that you actually really do need to either have a recording or go over your, you know, go over the your setup with someone and, and really ask ask them you know how you sound whether it sounds okay potentially even get them to record you and then send it back to you so that you can hear what you sound like on their end this is the heart of both basically to get feedback on all fronts but specifically asking for audio feedback is particularly helpful or just checking for it yourself once you know that this is a key actually seal achilles heel in presentations Okay, but now I also want to say that when there are lots of people, there's something else that actually happened to me once I missed it. If you have multiple videos, what I did is I had a sound test for everyone. And once before, when I was behind the scenes organizing it, some of the sound was too low. So I promised myself this can never happen again, but I didn't check for whether everyone was the same. And one person who was the moderator was much louder. So watch for audio balance also, especially if you're doing a big group meeting and lots of people are talking, just do a little audio test before and see. Now, here's an example of what that imbalance sounds like. Thanks, Arjun. Please unmute your mic and take it away. Good evening. Today, we are going to be... How does your background of the Naval officer discussions at the dinner table explain the transition to entrepreneurship, Patul? Uh, thank you, Arjun. That's a very good introduction. And hello, everyone. Do you see how jarring it can be when one is much louder than the other? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a uh, it's interesting because what's what's really happening in that case is you're you're getting used to one type of audio and then you have to re you kind of have to refocus on this other type of audio. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about audio being potentially very fatiguing because you're changing the the the, the focus or how you're listening to the audio has to change as a function of what the sound quality as well as the, 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 the loudness of the audio is. And here I should stress, it was my, it was my fault, my responsibility. I, I did a mic check with everyone, but I didn't realize it was much louder until much later. So now I have everyone to give feedback. If there's a lot of everyone, can we hear everyone? 
more or less the same volume. Next step is to get these two decisions out of the way. The first decision is, are you going to be standing or sitting? And I strongly experiment, I strongly suggest experimenting. My early videos, I did all sitting, but once I decided, let me just experiment standing. It was such a different state of energy. It's not that it, it's not so different for the viewer, whether I'm sitting or standing, I can still get the framing the same. But I found that standing works extremely well for me. And lots of people who have come to me for this kind of support, I just say, give it a try. Just give it a try standing and most of them default to standing after that. So be open-minded and experiment. And if you think that you come across better, you're thinking you're, you're more in flow when standing, then try to make that your default setting. And the second is landscape or portrait. I'm just gonna put this down here because sometimes if you're doing it on a phone, you might go by portrait while you intend to do landscape. So be deliberate. This recording I want in landscape. This recording I want in portrait. Now for these kind of meetings, almost always we settle on landscape, but be deliberate and plan it in advance. You really need to set this up once and set it up once in a way that you like it, right? It doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but it just needs to be good enough so that it doesn't distract from your content, right? You want it to kind of advance your content forward, the content being what you're trying to tell people. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, should, it should be set up in a way that it doesn't distract from your content. And now we move on to our second concept, which is the case studies. So what we'll do now, son, is we'll take a look and then we will assess them against the three guidelines. And this is where the guidelines actually come to life. You can see strengths and you can see weaknesses and you can see how impactful it is. So the purpose of doing this is competence modeling. We're really asking ourselves two questions. Who does this well and what can we learn from them? So we're constantly asking. So I've taken screenshots across a wide range and we'll discuss them now. Well, what's your first impression of this video presence? It seems pretty good to me. I mean, he seems engaged and uh, overall reasonably framed. Okay, and also the, the, I know you could say that, the, let, let's actually take a look. Can you see the first guideline? Yep. Does he meet it? He does. Okay, second guideline? He does, he meets it. Yep, so here are the case where all three guidelines are very nicely met. Now, some people have given me feedback, he doesn't have four fingers. So I say two things, it's just a guideline. But yep. also, he was, it was a live session, and he's talking and moving back and forth, yep. and I just took a screenshot. So yeah, no, that. exactly. And I think it's important, actually, to also highlight the fact that guidelines are not rules. They're guidelines, and uh, you, know, you can be a little flexible with them, uh, but they just help you, uh, in general, get these, uh, get these best practices into place. Correct. You should default to them, but as a willful choice, you can certainly digress, and we'll see a few cases of that. Now this one absolutely captured my attention. I really like black, black backgrounds. So I immediately took a screenshot, but as I was coaching others, I got a lot of pushback saying that no, one guideline is not being met. Something about the clothing is distracting and the clothing, the fact that the color merges with the black ground is distracting. So why don't you comment on guideline number one? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and when, you, when you look at this, clearly her, her face is visible, her eyes are visible. Um, but the, you know, the issue is that for me all, as well, this this uh, this 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 black jacket with um, a black background is doesn't doesn't really do it, and it is a little bit distracting. And I think it highlights the fact that uh, you know different people have different preferences. So just because you follow a guideline doesn't mean you'll please everybody. And the second thing, it also means that just because you like something doesn't mean that your audience uh, will appreciate it or find it to be a positive. So there's value in under in getting feedback on the choices that you make from your audience, from your intended audience. Fully agree. What about second guideline? Yeah, there's absolutely. I mean, it looks like she's looking at me, so. Absolutely, looking at the lens. And third guideline? Yeah, and the framing is also good. Okay, so only on guideline number one, fell through a little bit. Now, the first two guidelines were very much in studio settings. Now, the third guideline is a YouTuber who I follow. I find him to be a very independent and thoughtful journalist but he breaks all the rules and nonetheless, he's super compelling. He looks away, he talks down, he, but, but he still follows the guideline, but that's his natural style. So here's an example of a person's personality and brand uh, being more important than the guidelines. So I have put a little bit of a slightly higher red cross the background, though he uses it as part of props. When he's talking about a topic, he'll have something here, he'll have something on his t-shirt. And also lens at eye level, looking directly at lens. He doesn't do it all the time but he's still super effective as a communicator. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's, that, that's you know, uh, it's, it's not an accident, right? This guy's a professional and he's put a lot of thought into his background, right? What these guidelines really serve as is a way for you to quickly 
make an effective, you have to set up an effective video presence. It doesn't mean that these are the only ways to do it. Um, and in fact, if you spend time and you you spend effort into uh, actually improving it, you can you can build up whatever uh, kind of whatever set, uh, if you want to call it a set, kind of whatever set that you want. And it can be very effective and it can be very compelling. Uh, but the, the thing to keep in mind is that you need to spend the time in developing it, getting feedback and, and, and fine tuning it, which clearly someone who's a professional and, and, and makes a living off of this type of, uh, this type of program, hey, clearly they spent the time doing that. Yeah, and in fact, I'll say this, this may be for future viewers, but do check out Bo's channel and see how effective his communication is. And he's just doing it with garage and a basic equipment at home. Anyone can do this and be very, have great video presence. Now, this is a lady with whom I did some online classes. In fact, I picked up a lot of these tips from her and she's sitting down. All the others I think were standing so far. I couldn't quite make out for the second lady in black, whether she was sitting or standing, but here you can clearly see sitting and yet if she meets the guidelines, everything is fine. I have put a little bit of a cross for guideline number one, because my preference is to have no distractions in the background, but that's just a personal preference. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and you know, I think that that's, uh, I think that that is essentially uh, a, a choice that you can make. And it should, it should be, uh, it should be a, a reflection of your, your personality and what you want to communicate. So if you think a background is fine, then then, then uh, if you think, you know, the type of background where there's a lot of things in it is fine, that's also fine as long as you're making sure that you are communicating effectively. And it, the, it, the background is just serving to add to the message that you're, uh, that you're giving and it doesn't serve to subtract from that message. Correct. It sort of, it, it, this kind of background has a has a ambience of welcoming you into their home also. So it, it's very appealing for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. But she's also, I, I can't recognize, she's a really good coach. Check out her work. <laughs> and look at how naturally and effortlessly she's speaking to the lens. And it comes back to saying, face is well lit up, eyes are visible. This is the most important. Everything else is very natural. Now, this lady is a coach who I went to many years ago. And she recorded this on an iPad in her office with just a couple of basic lights. And yet, I couldn't help but noticing how close to perfection the face lighting and eyes lit up guideline is met. Um, and I asked her for permission if I could take this because I consider it to be so representative of what is possible in exactly the same setting where you are. She was using an iPad, nothing special. I just put the cross a little bit darker because I find the background to be slightly distracting. But like I'm, I'm sure like the previous coach, this is a deliberate choice. She wants to welcome you into her working space. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it looks very effective here. Um, and, it, you know, it seems like she is... Uh, again, these are these are choices that the, the 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 these are choices that these people have made in order to elicit certain responses from the audience, and they're they're made with forethought and they're made with uh, I'm sure with feedback. I was just going to say, in fact, when I, I went to these slides with her also once, and she said actually I was initially doing recording sitting down, but people around me in my office asked me to stand up and give it a try, and she found it was very effective way of doing it. So one yeah, that's time, exactly feedback. Up. And so um, I think that again, what it goes back to the goes back to the point that what we're doing here is we're laying out a basic foundation, and from that foundation you can build up your own personalized uh, your own personalized set, which is you know very equivalent to having your own choice of clothing and your own personal style, which you, you know you wear to work and you know the color you like the colors you like you like the types of clothes you like and this is a similar this is a similar. Um, uh, principle, right? Everybody doesn't wear exactly the same thing every day. There is one consideration on video, which is that the color of your clothing can change the nature of your face lighting. We'll come to it later. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. Okay. So now this is uh, one of my friends. I had helped him. He had given this presentation. I had helped him uh, before giving it. It was the first live uh, Zoom presentation and he, he's extremely good, but somehow we failed to test out with the actual clothes he was wearing. And this proved to be very reflective. So neither of us caught it. And now, because we went over the slides again, we gave each other this feedback and you can see how much the sort of, it's almost like a burnout whiteness of his shirt. It, it does take away from any, the very good presenter, but it's sort of a slight distraction. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. I, I think that, I think that overall, it's quite a, uh, quite a positive thing in the sense that, uh, not the shirt, but I mean, overall, it's quite positive in the sense that the guidelines seem to be followed. You know, I, 
it seems to be engaging, seems to be talking to me. Um, but again, it's like one of these things where it pulls some, there's some amount of attention that gets pulled towards it. Yeah, but this is how we tweak, you know, we keep going and each time we they try to improve it just a little bit. Okay, now I put this one in because he's extremely famous, Seth Myers. But one advantage about Zoom presentation, it is a great democratizer. He no longer has a great unfair advantage over any of us. No matter what he's doing, because it was a pandemic, he had to set himself up. I'm sure they had a lot of thought, but this, this looks like something anyone could do. So keep that in mind. It can also, though it feels constraining at times, it offer it confers a great advantage to you if you put in the planning and the thoughtfulness. You, the best of the best, don't have much of an advantage over you as far as video presence goes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, what do you really need? You need a camera, you need a microphone, you need some lighting, and you need a controlled background. And you need uh, thought for thought and planning, which is what this video is all about. Absolutely, absolutely. You need some thought thoughtfulness needs to go into what you're doing. Okay, so let's proceed. Now we go a little bit quicker. Now this guy is a very famous uh, political analyst and this was in the early days, but I put this in here because here lens is below eye level and a quick heuristic, a guideline is when you see too much of the roof or too much of the upper wall, your lens is too low. And a few months later I saw him and here you can see he must have got some feedback and everyone starts adjusting so that it becomes, they come more in, in, in compliance with the guidelines. So this is an example on the left side of the camera too low. And if you go to this, this is another one, but this is the exact opposite. The camera is too high. You can see too much of the floor. And even this was in the early days of the lockdown. A little bit later, <laughs> he's got it all in order. And these are professionals on television. Everyone is moving towards this. So as time goes by, uh, videos like this should help people to get more into the compliance with the guidelines, unless they deliberately choose to do something else. Now here's another group. This was the larger Zoom meeting. This was their very first meeting. And a little bit later, so one was in July, one was in October. They must have all got feedback. But now if you see any of these group meetings, it tends to be more like the image on the right-hand side, um, which is, I'm going to call this the new normal. And I think I think these are, these are powerful because what you're seeing is the evolution of people who do this professionally. And you can see that they're all moving towards the same thing. Um, but the other thing, the other reason that it's also powerful is that uh, what it really shows is that these guidelines are just basic principles and that each one of these folks is personalizing, uh, is kind of personalizing their video presence to match their own um, preferences. Absolutely. But okay, th these people also weren't real professionals as far as lighting in this thing goes. They were like professional politicians. But here's an example. Ted, like is a renowned uh, organization and uh, I would say almost a movement, but this was the first uh, virtual presentation and you can see on the right hand side too much roof on the left hand side too much floor but I think you know <laughs> you, you see it once you get feedback and this is where they ended up now the second one I still don't like Al Gore he's, he's too cut off he's looking like a talking head but the third one like you can see them everyone's getting better and better yeah exactly and I mean again this is uh, uh, the other thing that this highlights is that you don't necessarily need to use extremely expensive equipment. You don't need to have a high resolution camera uh, in order to just kind of follow these basic principles. Uh, while you can add a little bit to the top by uh, including that, including fancy lighting, doing all of those kind of things, you can still have effective communication with relatively low cost equipment with just a little bit of thought put into the, okay. um, the setup. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, in just having a good mic, having basic light, lights like $5, $10, you can get pretty good adjustable white light, which you can clip on. So it meets the requirements. Everyone has enough. Now here, this is the best of the best. Uh, one of my favorite shows, I might add. But I put this one in because the lady in the center has got slightly more reddish lighting and the, to the, the commentators on the left and right have got a little bit more white lighting. And as you start looking for these, uh, for more and more improvement, you pick up a few tweaks like this. But what I did now is I took the very same one and put a black bar at the bottom. And this is how most people are at the bottom. You know, the, the framing is out here. You can tell what a difference there is by just comparing them top and bottom. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's that's actually somewhat that's that's, that's somewhat powerful because it does it what it shows is that there's there's somewhat of a uh, there's a subconscious disturbance that happens when we frame ourselves in certain ways and especially in the in the way that we kind of naturally do this framing you know when you think about it from like a, a facetime perspective or you're just chatting with a friend um or you know a video call with your parents something like that 
Uh, and, and I think it, it, it kind of tells us that that is not ideal in the sense that what we have learned from there and what we have set up there is not really, um, is not really the way that we want to go. Okay, so now that we've got the framing and lighting, what I want to do is this is competence modeling. I'm going to play a short video. It's one and a half minutes. It's Barack Obama and a late night show host. They're talking about a time that Bob Dylan came to the White House, performed and left without saying a single word to the president. But I've included this to see how much content, how much conversation, storytelling, humor you can have in short segments. So to, now we're actually going to watch a presentation, but also look at how the framing brings their content to life. Bob Dylan, did, I don't really remember the story. Did he not talk to you or something? Or that, that, that's what happened. He, he was Dylan-esque. He's exactly how you wanted him to be. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we had, I, I describe in the book, we had these concerts um, and, and they were really wonderful. Uh, they'd be themed, you know, so you had a Motown night or you had a, uh, you know, a Broadway or yep. uh, we had a poetry slam. And, uh, you know, we'd usually have kids from the surrounding area come in and the artists would do workshops on music or uh, performance, and then they'd do rehearsals. And, and so by the time you actually had the concert, you know, they'd been hanging around for a while. There was a photo line. Dylan, he skips all that, right? Literally shows up a, a few minutes before he's about to go on, comes on on his trio, does this incredible rendition of uh, the times they are changing. Gosh. Beautiful. Yeah. Finishes walks off the stage, stands in front of Michelle and me, does a quick nod, leaves. He's out, yeah. That's it. He's gone, yeah. And, you know, just mysterious, you know, has a little kind of quirky smile on his face. Um, yep. Perfect. Exactly um, what you want from Bob Dylan. That's, that's what you want from Bob Dylan. I took multiple screenshots from that interview. And you can see how the little planning, that, that whole segment, one and a half minutes, it came to life, but there was quite a good bit of planning, framing, lighting, all of that, which contributed. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with that. It would have been a totally different experience. Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing I think it also, what it also points out is that, you know, we said that with, you can set up a good experience for your viewers with pretty simple, you know, simple equipment. But what you're seeing here, uh, and especially when you look at the two of them is, is you can, but you can see the, 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 the difference that a professional setup actually makes, you know? Um, and so it's, it's not to say that they're, it's not to say that everyone's the same and everything is the same, but, but uh, uh, what it does tell you that you are probably not gonna be setting up a studio where every time you give a video call or you do a video call, you look like, uh, you know, President Obama or Jimmy Fallon here, probably not gonna happen but you can follow the you know, basic guidelines to make sure that you're at least communicating effectively. No, but let me push back a little bit on that. Okay, the studio guidelines here for Jimmy Fallon, it's basically the fancy TV at the background, but the rest of it, my computer is here, my chair is here, my lights are on. If you can just make that standard, like uh, Obama's sitting down in obviously some place in his house or in a, in a residence, it's not in an office. So you can come to these guidelines uh, with a little bit of planning and you have that the, 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 you take away the unfair advantage of a lot of other people. You have this opportunity of being as personable if you make that effort. I agree. I agree with that. I think the other thing is also that uh, the, the, the kind of the major difference between these professionally framed studios is that they probably all have multiple lights and they use those lights to very carefully kind of frame the faces and create the shadows, which, which, which provides a kind of a third dimension of depth that a lot of us you know, won't have on our videos. Good point. At least they are meeting the guidelines and this is competence modeling. Now here's an example of, I mean, two icons in tech, but they didn't meet the guidelines. I'm sure that after one video, they won't let this happen again. So the other way I look at it is for good balance, the size and the position of the head in the frame is a very you know, a heuristic. So here, obviously, uh, they, they had to do better with the framing imbalance. You agree? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Let's go to the next slide. So when I put a target here, now we've sort of done a, a good analysis of the basics. And this, I think, brings life to the guidelines, where they work, where we've fallen short. So anywhere you see a target, I think that this is good enough. So here is an example of two reporters, uh, a senator and a reporter. Key point here is they're following the guidelines and they become, it's easy to listen to them. Um, and this is 
uh, a screenshot from the same interview of uh, Mark Shields and David Brooks. But this, if we can make this, it's good enough. Now, here, Morning Joe is a television show, but the minute I saw this and I started taking screenshots, I looked what this, and I said, this is the new normal. There's something about, they're, they're lower down than most average people, but I couldn't help thinking this is the new normal. And I saw them many months later. Here, you have seven people on the screen. That's really crowded. But the way that's framed, it does feel that you're talking to them quite naturally. Yeah. So uh, that's why I put this in. This is going to be the new normal, according to me. And now, since we are talking of targets, this is ideal framing. This is what you should shoot for. Uh, here I caught another one. Mark Zuckerberg, he was having some technical interview with one of these famous YouTubers. But he's sitting down. Uh, he's slightly hunched, but he doesn't have any great advantage over any of us. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with that. And I, I think that, uh, um, uh, I think that, again, you know, you come down and, and when you look at it, uh, he's following the guidelines. Maybe, maybe his... Maybe his uh, his shirt is a little bit uh, dark, uh, but again, just personal preference. Uh, but I think that you know the key thing is that they've deployed lighting in an effective way, and that's kind of you know. And and I think if you kind of analyze what they're doing here, one of the things that they're highlighting is that they're using a different color lighting for his face in the background, so he really stands out. Um, so his face is a little bit brighter, a little bit wider in the background. The lighting is a little bit more yellow, uh, but. Depth of field is small. Hmm. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, but these are, again, these are small things. Like, you don't need every video conference that you're on to look like a professional. The target, this is good enough. Exactly. It doesn't take much. I mean, he doesn't have that much of an advantage over you. I put this together because here there's a nice balance, though. One is sitting and one is standing. So even if you're some of your, some people in the, if you have a large meeting, try to get them to have a same, more or less the same framing. That is, that makes it easier for your audience to not be fatigued. Absolutely. And this one in as a target, because I suggest to everyone, try to find one person that who you think is really good and use that as competence modeling. And I had heard, I, he's actually, I think he's the boss of the your UT University now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think he became president. What happened is that he was the very, very uh, illustrious military career, including the, the raid that over Bin Laden. And then at some time, there was uh, Donald Trump retweeted a conspiracy tweet that it's all fake or so this poor chap had to come on television but what i put this up for the remarkable poise and grace and you know he was not domineering at all but he was like there was something so polished about him. <laughs> this is this is the way i would like to appear so my suggestion is if you find someone that you really like take a screenshot and slowly slowly work towards getting to the same places as the person you admire and here what happened is excellent posture and presence yeah, exactly. And I think that the, you know, basically what's happening here is that, uh, you know, you want to find someone that you like and, uh, you know, someone that matches your personality and then kind of, kind of try to emulate them because they're probably already doing it right. So you don't need to spend additional time working it out. Now we come to a key, which is optimal face lighting and eyes clearly visible. And here we more, I just want to focus on the topic of specs. Glasses are fine as long as the eyes can be seen okay. But if, if, especially if you've been presenting for a long time and your eyes are not visible, like either you've got dark glasses or you have a lot of reflection, it becomes fatiguing for your viewer because it's not natural. So here's an example of two people. They both got glasses. Everything looks fine. You can see their eyes. But when a third person comes on without glasses, somehow you can make out that this is more. Your attention will automatically go to the person without glasses because we are looking at we. Our initial focus is on the eyes. So my suggestion is try without specs. You have nothing to lose. I have been using specs from the late, from the maybe the late to mid 1960s, all through school, all through college. But I just gave it a try and it works. So give it a try, take a few screenshots and see, get some feedback. If it works better for your audience, it's worth taking the effort. And sometimes you need to have glasses, that's fine. But then if you're using these small lights, like the ring lights, be really careful of the reflection in your glasses. This guy was saying, the person in the center, he was speaking. I remember it was, what he was saying was very good, but this kept, kept distracting me. So try to avoid this because you, you, your audience can't fully naturally listen to what you're saying. And here I put four examples from completely different places. Then, Reflection-free lenses are the way to go if you want to have glasses. One, uh, you can all, the person on the left, you can almost not make out that they have glasses on. The second one is a home video. The third one is an outside shoot. But I 
selected this because you can see the reflection on the frames, but you can't see them on the lenses. So this is definitely possible. The person on the right, I think he's the boss of the Davos World Economic Forum. But in each case, the goal of having your eyes clearly visible, if you're going to be presenting a lot on Zoom or remotely, it's worth making the effort for your audience. And in some cases, you might want to use your glasses for reading. So you can do it very naturally. Here's a short 15 second video to show you how it's being done. Naturally easy. So this is a, this is a good guideline for glasses. Now what I want to talk about some um, is the color of your shirt. It, it does matter when you are in a remote setting. For example, take a look at my face lighting and the only thing that is different is the color of my shirt in these three side by side. This is the second one. This is now what I'm normally wear when presenting and see how the color of my face has changed from a sort of chalky gray to a yellowish. And when I wear the red shirt, my face looks most natural. So it's almost in my case, I have to select my clothing to suit the camera so that face lighting is optimal. For a long time, I was using this uh, built-in camera and the feedback I was getting, the quality is not good enough. You really need to upgrade to a webcam. And when I did that green, the background black curtain, you could see all the folds and all it looked unprofessional. So I had to do something and change my setting. But to show you how it looks, um, just take a look. So this is with a blue shirt. This is why apart from choosing for your shirt, just for what you like or branding, make sure it doesn't compromise what's happening to your face. So if I were to wear a black shirt in exactly the same settings, that my face would be tremendously overexposed. So literally, if you're using iPhone or a webcam, the different cameras, make sure you're complying with guideline number one. Now, this is the point I want to stress. Almost everything we've discussed is a one-time setup. 15 to 45 minutes, you make an effort. If you're going to be doing this a lot, put in that 15 to 45 minutes, and especially if I'm coaching people for events, this is part where I really come on. I mean, we can't, we're not asking for much, but for 15 to 45 minutes, really make an effort, everything, clothing, lighting, test yourself, framing and get it out of the way. The only thing that you have to practice continuously outside this 15 to 45 minutes is looking at the lens while speaking. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes uh, perfect sense. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's an easier, it's an easier setup uh to do than buying an entire wardrobe of clothes right uh if you think about it equivalently um and then the other the other thing is that um you know it's 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 something that requires a little bit of effort so you really have to make the effort to do it okay yeah but then you if you're going to be presenting a lot from any one location it's worth getting this out of the way yeah it absolutely is it absolutely it's not is expensively. i mean you take the whole lot you take an adjustable table and a webcam and a couple of lights and this thing it's probably 100 to 200 dollars you can get equipment that is more than good enough and that will last you for a good two to three years so that the payoff is high so now let's do the recap three visual guidelines one audio guideline the first guideline is face lighting eyes clearly visible clothes and background should not dominate or distract now it's time to actually memorize this so the next time you're looking at anything on television yeah. you're kind of it. it's almost like uh a star athlete let's say a quarterback player or star musician when they're watching another game or an orchestra, they're processing, what are the experts doing? We're trying to begin to look at it like this so that we become more and more presentable on video. This is the most second, most second guideline, lens at eye level, look directly at the lens while presenting. This requires practice. Third guideline is the framing. Decide what you want, get it out of the way once. See, I have settled for somewhere here, which is what I call my optimal. So I know where I should stand more or less to be okay. This, I find a lot of, I don't want to say pushback, but when I'm coaching someone, they do it. And then in the live event, they're back to something like this. You know, they, they, They're so anxious with the setup that they go back to their default. They don't kind of build it in, which is unfortunate. But it's happened quite often. Poor audio is more fatiguing than poor video and external mic is good. That's, that's really the summary of this presentation. Beware of video and audio imbalances if there are a lot of people. And if you're going forth, back and forth a lot. And here, just, just put some best practices. You see the targets on top. Here's everyone who has met the guidelines. This one is particularly interesting to me because the lady on the right looks much meeting the guidelines better as far as face lighting goes. <laughs> on the left I agree. The yeah, I agree. I agree with that. So that might just be because of the poor quality of the video that was put up on YouTube, you know. Yeah, but, that's uh, possible. There's no unfair advantage. I mean, yeah. And then here are 
all iconic people. <laughs> There's no reason why you can't be as follow the same guidelines and come out looking as professional as them. And this is the new normal. So work hard to get, at least to getting here. This is the new normal. Everyone's doing this. I'm repeating. I'm stressing. 15 to 45 minutes, less time than it takes to watch this video, maybe half the time it takes to watch this video. You put in that much of an effort and you're done for maybe months, years. Only practice is required for speaking to the lens. And now we go to our side notes. I want to discuss this. Anything you want to discuss about the guidelines, case studies or recap? No, I think, I think that, uh, uh, I think that, you know, we've covered it well. And, uh, you know, I think we've both highlighted what the guidelines are, as well as potentially the, the limitations of guidelines. And, you know, the, the flexibility of guidelines. Yeah, I noticed that you keep stressing this a lot. That's really good. That's why we're not say, calling them rules. We're calling them guidelines. Yeah. First, you follow them. Just follow them blindly. Get them out of the way. Become comfortable. And then deliberately break them if they're not working for you. Exactly. But don't take them out of convenience or out of not making an effort just because they are only guidelines. Yeah, they're and useful. I think that, I think that the, there is a certain reticence that many people have to um, you know, potentially when you're presenting, it can be a, it's just like, it's almost like stage fright, right? Uh, there can be a certain amount of, uh, shyness associated with it. And I think some of these guidelines, what they kind of help you do is they kind of help you make sure that that shyness is not being projected and it's not coloring the message that you're sending forward. Yeah. More than shyness, it's anxiety and diffidence. Something happens, we get little, Absolutely. just, just, guarded when talking to a video. So practice does it, but these guidelines help to make it more natural. Now I want Absolutely. to talk about use of slides and recording. So use, especially on these, use pictures as much as possible. Now here was an event I was involved in, but we were recording it and he's a very, very compelling speaker, but to have him in a small corner on the right, we kind of lost his presence totally. And then he was using some slides like this. So this particular recording, one of our earliest events, it, it just fell short. The lady on the right was the Moderator, the person on the left was a panelist. They were having a discussion. But these kind of slides just have to say that they belong to the past. You just can't absorb it. There's too much information and too much numbers. And I gave him a feedback session after this, and he immediately agreed with that. So this, this era of slides belongs to the past. Just, just be cautious when using it. Now, here's another example of someone who was on one of our shows. She had sent me a video recording of one of her earlier shows, and she had left this slide on for about 10 minutes while talking. How long can you look at the book? So this is the second area that requires practice. If you're using slides on and off, you have to practice getting them on, getting them off, getting them on, getting them off. Because, I mean, she's a really compelling speaker, but uh, she diminished her presence with this particular format. And here's another example from another program we did. This was a group of entrepreneurs. They're very impressive people, but having them so small, uh, dominated uh, by a slide, I think gives us an area for improvement. Here's another one to the very first Zoom meeting. Here the portion is, if you're the host, try to avoid doing the recording yourself. There's too many things are going on. And then you switch from one screen to another. So if it's an important event, you want to record it, have someone else to do the recording and make them comfortable with the various setups, which is what we look at next. So here was a presentation that I gave recently, and this was a default recording. If you go to YouTube, this is what it looks like, but clearly this doesn't work for me. Uh, many people say that I have quite a good presence and it would be better if a little bit more of that came through. So the way to do that is you can go to your settings on Zoom and you can select the side-by-side -side operation when you're doing your share screen. And you might recall, so I did this with you. Uh, we had a practice session. I wanted to simulate that. So the default setting is you and me, but then you use the slider. There's a slider line, there's a drag line. If you pull these two, you can adjust. And once when I was coaching someone, he said, this was the most useful information I've received through everything. It suddenly just changes the viewer experience. So be aware of this. If you're recording, have a viewer whose full task is to get the framing and the writing and the balance right. The, on the right is a much more pleasant view for someone who's watching, especially if it goes on for an hour or so. Yeah, and especially if it's a, especially if it's a discussion, because with the discussion, you kind of want to, you kind of want to put a face to the, uh, to the, you know, to the voice. No, but even when it's not a discussion, when the content is very engaging, um, just to see the person deliver it. Absolutely. It's different. It's, it's like seeing a person versus reading a paper. It, it is. But it is a different. This, while it is a better viewer experience, it is also worth keeping in mind that if it's a very scientific or information uh, 
dense slides, then you do want to put the full focus on the slide. So again, this is a guideline and not a rule. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, uh, I guess what it really what it really comes down to is uh, how the information is being conveyed, right? So in a lot of these in a lot of these slides, there is there's a, in a lot of, for example, scientific presentations, there's actually a tremendous amount of information on the slide. And what's actually happening in a presentation is that the the uh, the presenter actually kind of serves as a guide that's guiding people through the information on the slides, but is not comprehensively describing it. So the opportunity there, when you have a lot of information on a slide and the speaker is acting like a guide, is that depending on the uh, the comfort level of the audience, of each audience member with that information, with what you're talking about, they will be able to, get, different people will actually get different amounts of information by being able to pay attention to the slide while also potentially having the, uh, the, um, the, the, the speaker kind of guiding them through it. And so that's one of the reasons why sometimes you want to have enough, uh, you know, you want to make sure that the slides dominate while sometimes you want this 50-50 balance. It really depends on what you're using the slides to do. Like yours or if I'm doing an engineering one or you're doing a science one, it's worth paying attention to this. And if someone is recording it, at which point do I want the slide to be bigger? At which point do I want the slide to be? So it's also a good idea to have not too much information on a on a single slide, though sometimes it's necessary for sequential. It just requires thought and planning. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And then frequently, when a site is not telling you anything, just take it off, so it becomes a conversation, like it's on the image on the right. Now I want to come to the end notes. So this is kind of counterintuitive, but it's really important. All this framing and lighting and everything that we talked about is the equivalent of dressing up well or having your office properly polished or if you're bringing guests home to have your home spick and span. But it counts for nothing. Content, connection, and wholesome communication, your intent to make a contribution, to speak clearly, this is far more important than the best lighting and framing. So after having spent so much time on lighting and framing, don't fool yourself for a moment that your presentation is about lighting and framing. We just want it out of the way. It's the same thing like you dress up properly, but that's no excuse to give a sloppy speech in front of a live audience. And this message sunk home for me, this TED Talks is a remark. Chris Anderson has literally brought public speaking a new phase of life. And he's written in his book, right, somewhere close to the beginning. If you have picked up this book because you have dreams of being a charismatic speaker, strutting your stuff on the dead stage, he writes here, put the book down right away. <laughs> Go and get an idea because style without substance is awful. And this, this was a message I immediately got. So all the best framing and all the best lighting without, if it's only to showcase your style, your audience is going to judge you to be awful. So what is good then? What is good? Uh, I say the gold standard for public speaking for me is this duo. Uh, Ted Sorensen was a speechwriter and John F. Kennedy, but they, they knew each other for years and they had become almost like political soulmates, you might say. And this is what Ted Sorensen later said. The best speeches... They do not move people because of the grandeur of language, or in our case, the superb lighting and framing and background. The best speeches move people because of the grandeur of an idea. So don't lose that focus. When you've been given an opportunity to speak, focus on the idea, the goodness of the idea, the grandeur of the idea, and how effectively we can communicate it. And in order to do this, they had a my favorite checklist in all of public speaking. Clarity, brevity, levity, charity. If you can bring a little bit of this into your speech, you're on your way to having a really good speech. Clarity, brevity, levity, charity with ideas that are worth spreading with substantive ideas is the foundation and the secret to truly a great communication and great speeches. And I have a, developed a few of my own, I call them the gold standard. Above all, you have to be personal, not being a show off, not being a bully, but that is not enough. At the same time, you have to be professional. You have to be respectful for your audience uh, and you have to be professional and also to be polished. What I mean by polished is you should be at least as well dressed or speak in a, as polished a way as your audience or a little bit better. These three are good hallmarks as guidelines to know if you're doing well with your presentation. And simultaneously, you have to be convincing. You have to have logic. You have to have strong arguments. You have to have intellectual prowess. But that alone is not enough. That can be sent by a written message. You have to be charming. And by charming, I mean engaging. You have to be engaged with your topic. You have to be engaged with your audience. So by charming, I don't mean artful flattery. I don't mean artful manipulation. I mean being likable 
because you like the subject so much, because you're so deeply engaged with the subject and with your audience. And also you have to be willing to be cajoling. You have to, occasionally you have to be that arm twisting politician. You have to state the perils clearly that if we ignore these perils, we will indeed pay a price. So good communication involves all of these elements. And I understand that they say a model of the brain, there's a reptilian brain and the mammalian brain and the, the modern brain. So the reptilian brain will, re will respond best to cajoling and the mammalian brain will respond best to being charming and the rational brain will respond best to be convincing. So this way you're getting more of a whole brain communication going on. And it's worth factoring all these into your speech. Serve your audience, you have to make them comprehend. Intellectual prowess, clarity, simplicity, structure, transition, logical arguments. Then you have to make them care, be engaged with your topic. And finally, you have to make them remember. So now if you go back to my presentation, to make them comprehend, we talked about three plus one guidelines to make our audience more engaged, to make them understand we did the case studies. And in order to make them remember, we did a recap. So this is a good way of building it in. And if you don't use this as a checklist, what part of my speech will help my audience to comprehend? What part of my presentation will make them care, will make them, oh, I got it, I got to get better. And what part will make them remember? Factoring this in is what makes a presentation memorable and engaging. It comes down to very simple. Rehearsal is the work, performance is the relaxation. This was an actor when we were young. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not. But remarkable actor. This is what he said. Rehearsal is the work, performance is the relaxation. So if I'm coaching a group of people, this is where I tell them this. At this point, I can't help you anymore. So the key here is to come down to this. Once you're on video, don't dwell at all on lighting and framing. The time for that is done. Focus on finding the zone. I want to remove anxiety. I want to remove boredom. There's no place for distraction or self-consciousness or self-centeredness. This is the responsibility of the speaker. Your audience is giving you a very special gift, time and attention. This is your responsibility. Find the zone. Let everything else fade away. And all of your attention should be on your content, your connection, and your wholesome communication. And this sounds like trite advice, but it actually goes very deep into science. This is what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow, he described the state. Once you can bring all your attention to something, it, it transforms the amount of communication that's taking place. So I'm going to play a small video from a TED talk. He's talking about someone who composes, just doing notes on, he said, putting little marks on paper, but how he goes into a completely altered state when he's doing it. And that is the altered state that we are trying to find when we are presenting. He enters that different reality. Now, he says also that this is so intense an experience that it feels almost as if it didn't exist. And that sounds like um, a kind of a romantic exaggeration. But actually, our nervous system is incapable of processing more than about 110 bits of information per second. And in order to hear me and understand what I'm saying, you need to process about 60 bits per second. That's why you can't hear more than two people. You can't understand more than two people talking to you. Well, in, when you are really involved in this um, uh, completely engaging process of creating something new, as this man does, he doesn't have enough attention left over to monitor how his body feels or his problems at home. He can't feel even that he's hungry or tired. His body disappears, his identity uh, disappears from his consciousness because he doesn't have enough attention, like none of us do, to really do well something that requires a lot of concentration and at the same time to feel that he exists. So existence temporarily suspended. For me, this was one of the most eye-opening moments because I have gone into this zone some, many times, not just while presenting, whenever you're doing anything that's well, whether it's music or sports, but to understand that, that, that you have only finite attention and we have systems that can shut it all off. It's an aspiration that in the end, I want to find the flow zone. And for that, everything else has to be out of the way, lighting, framing. I want to focus on my content, on my connection with my audience and the wholesomeness of my intent. So to start tying it all together, don't stress perfection. These are only guidelines, but please don't be sloppy. Don't be unprepared. You owe your audience that duty of care to at least be prepared. And focus on making a contribution. This pressure on yourself to make a contribution because your audience is giving you their time and attention. Worth repeating, rehearsal is the work. 
If you don't rehearse, you will not have that opportunity. You, it'll be more difficult to find relaxation and flow in the performance. And let's bring it all together. Your content, your connection, your wholesomeness, your intention, your communication is far more important than lighting and framing. But lighting and framing is important. Don't be stressed on perfection, but don't be sloppy. Find the zone once you're on video. Yeah, and you know, thanks. And, and I think that you know, the second part of this presentation really puts the first part into context in the sense that what we're trying to do with everything we discussed in the first part of the presentation, lighting, framing, is we're actually trying to make it transparent. We're trying to draw the, we're, we're trying to make sure that that doesn't draw the, the, the audiences, a, a, that we don't draw the audience's attention towards that. I think that's really the key here. Unlike- um, I think I put it differently. Essentially, we are setting ourselves up for success. It's not the story of success. Yeah, exactly. So we have, you know, the audience has their 110 bits and we want to make sure that they are per second and they are focused on the content that we're, uh, that we're describing, not the, uh, not all of these peripherals or the goal of the goal of communication is to communicate ideas. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of, there are a lot of peripherals or peripherals around each idea, whether that is the, the way that you look, whether it's the language that you're using, whether it's the, you know, how the audience can hear you. Um, and a lot of those things, they really can't add to the idea, but they can detract from it. And a lot of these best practices are really set into place, not so that you have the perfect audio or the perfect look or the perfect um, uh, communication style, but instead you have one that doesn't distract from your main, your main message. And I think that's that's the key there. Yeah, and I would really love to see these ideas permeate much, much more into the world of science and technology and engineering. It's, it's just deeply underestimated how much benefit you can get from such a little effort. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. So that's why I'm really happy that we are making this video together. You're a scientist and an engineer, I've been an engineer, and I, what a marvelous profession. I mean, nothing in the world would ever come about without engineering and science. Exactly, and exactly. All so short in communication is it's, yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely true. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, because of the, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, because science and engineering is so idea driven, uh, there is sometimes a lack of understanding that the peripherals uh, around how you communicate your ideas, uh, there is a belief that those are unimportant. Uh, unfortunately, that belief uh, comes about because of the fact that those peripherals don't necessarily add. However, what people sometimes forget is that they very much can subtract. And that's where this work kind of needs to go in. We have come to the end of one hour. I hope it was useful for you. And I hope it was as enjoyable for you as it was for me to make this with my son, Rehan. Now, if you're not from the STEM world, the ideas are as relevant as ever, and of course you can incorporate them. But this is a message, especially for those who are from the STEM world, science, engineering, technology, built on a foundation of mathematics. John F. Kennedy pointed out, a speech is made great by the ideas conveyed. My son Rehan pointed out that our communication is primarily about ideas. So let me persuade you, Put your ideas out into the world, public speaking, video recording, Zoom meetings, written, but put them out because science, engineering, technology is the mother load of good, new, innovative ideas. So bring your ideas into the world with precision, with poetry and with power.